Good evening and welcome to Ron's Ramblings. This will be rambling number 25, which is part four in the life of Abraham. We ended part three with Abram camped in the extreme southern part of Israel. He's about where the red dot is that's just above me on this map, near the trade route that leads to Egypt. He's on his way to Egypt, but he's still in Canaan. This larger map shows the boundary of Egypt in red on its northeastern side. It follows the Egyptian river for a while as it comes down from the Mediterranean uh, and then stretches over to the eastern gulf of the Red Sea in pretty much a straight line. I want you to notice that blue dot, though, that's in the northeast part of that, or just northeast of that borderline. That is a, an oasis, uh, later becomes a city named Kadesh Barnea. It's the southernmost city in Israel. At least it is at this time. Kadesh, as it is often called, was an oasis that provided water year-round, and it was a key place in Israel's history. It's often visited later in scriptures when Moses leads the people out of Egyptian captivity. It was from Kadesh that the 12 spies were sent out to spy out Canaan. They were there for 40 days. It was near Kadesh that Moses struck the rock to bring water forth and disobeyed God. And it displeased the Lord. And as a result of that, Moses was not allowed to enter into Canaan, the promised land. It was at Kadesh that Aaron died and was buried. It was from Kadesh that the first attempt to take Canaan was launched, and it failed. And a few historians believe that the Israelites spent almost all of their 40 years in the wilderness right around Kadesh. I'm not sure if that's true. In fact, I don't think it is, but that's what's generally thought. But what you can see is that Kadesh was located along one of the major trade routes leading from Jerusalem all the way down into Egypt. We can't be exactly certain where Abram was camped, but from the text we know he was camped before entering Egypt, which puts him on the, the northeastern side of that red line. And we know that Abram and his group had come down from Bethel, where they were camped until the famine occurred, and we, that they were on their way to Egypt. So it is supposed by most uh, scholars and commentators, I guess, that he was following the trade route that would get him there because it would be the, the most often traveled route, the easiest for them to navigate and to, to eventually reach their place. So it may be that he was camped about where I've got the red dot. Uh, it may be that he wasn't there. It was someplace else. But let's assume it was there uh, at least uh, north east of that red border line. As we discussed in the last session, the Egyptians were descendants of Noah's youngest son, Ham. And as we saw back in part one of Abram's life, he had had some dealings with the descendants of Ham. And probably he was somewhat worried about going into Egypt because he's going to encounter them again. Because of Sarai's beauty, 
Sarah Ree. I'll get that name right one of these days. Because of Sarah Ree's beauty, Abram was convinced that the Egyptians were going to try to kill him so that they could take her away from him. We're told that in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 12. So perhaps while they're camped, one evening Abram tells Sarai his plan. They would tell the Egyptians that she was his sister so that they would not have to kill him in order to take her. That was partially true. Sarai was his half-sister. So it wasn't a complete lie, but it was a deception. He was planning to tell partial truth for the purpose of deceiving the Egyptians. Perhaps his planning this deception is because his faith was not yet strong enough that he could put his trust fully in the Lord. And so he felt a need for some precautions to be made and he was going to make them. While the scriptures do not mention exactly where in Egypt they went, it's almost certain that they ended up in Memphis. Memphis is one of the oldest and most important cities in ancient Egypt. It was originally named Minifer, which means the enduring and beautiful city. It was named that because the entire city had been built from mud bricks mixed with straw and then whitewashed a bright white. Later, it was renamed Memphis. It was located just at the entrance to the Nile River Valley and it served as the capital of ancient Egypt as well as a, being an important cultural and religious center. From the earliest of times, at least all the way until the Romans came, Memphis played a significant role in the lives of the people of Egypt. Several of the most famous kings constructed great monuments in the city there, and they built their burial pyramids on the western side of that city. But during the days of the Roman Empire, Memphis began to decline because a new settlement had begun about 15 miles north and eventually Memphis lay in ruins with most of the stones and the, the nice building materials that were there confiscated and taken to that new city about 15 miles north which became the new capital and later was named Cairo. But a part of Memphis still exists and still stands as an outdoor museum there in Cairo on the southern part of the modern Cairo. It's there where the ancient cemeteries are located and the most famous of the pyramids are there. And thousands and thousands of tourists flock there annually but as Abram arrives in Egypt, his assumption that he had made appears to have been correct. The young princes of Pharaoh have noticed Sarai's beauty, and they've told the Pharaoh about it. And the Pharaoh has issued instructions to them to bring her to him. The Pharaoh when he sees Sarai standing before him, recognized her beauty. And after being told that she was Abram's sister, the Pharaoh entreated Abram well for her sake. It's often thought that Genesis 12 and verse 15, partially I've got it on the screen for you to see, was a a bargaining between the Pharaoh and Abram over Sarai. That is, they were 
trying to establish a value of her worth that would satisfy both of them. But the truth of the matter is that's not what the meaning of the word that is translated entreated uh, is. It actually means that the Pharaoh treated Abram well because of Sarai. He was not buying Sarai. He was taking her. Abram had no thought in the matter. He had made up his mind that Pharaoh was going to have her. And he simply, since he was told that Abram was her brother, was presenting her brother with a gift out of respect. And that gift included many sheep and oxen, asses, men servants, maid servants, and camels. You may not have put it together. I'll get this all right in a minute. <clears throat> but remember, <coughs> Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. <coughs> Sarai was 10 years younger than him. So she would have been 65 years old when they left Haran. So these young princes of the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh himself are looking at a woman who is almost 66 years old and they find her stunning and they bragged on her beauty. And later, when the Pharaoh actually sees her standing before him, he agrees with their assessment. Obviously, her beauty and her vigor is still with her. We're going to see that Sari lives to be 127 years old. And she doesn't give birth to her only child until she's 90. But here she is at 65 or maybe 66 years old. And she has stirred the hearts of all of the Egyptians. I found that interesting. And it caused me to wonder about Egyptian women. Because I think of Queen Cleopatra as being a beautiful woman. Three of the images that you see on this screen are said to be Cleopatra. The one on the top left and the two in the center row. The rest are just Egyptian women. I googled Egyptian women and I found a fact that was that was surprising to me. According to both the historical records as well as modern testimony, over half of all English men view Egyptian women as being ugly. And it's said that they also believe that those Egyptian women fade early, whatever that might mean. I'm sure there must have been exceptions to that. But apparently those exceptions were very few. However, in spite of the fact that most of the Egyptian men believe their women were ugly, According to those same historical records, most Egyptian men were monogamous. A male pharaoh, on the other hand, usually had several wives. He also wanted to appear monogamous, so he had what was called a royal wife. That would be his real wife, the one that he was actually married to. But he also had lesser wives. They may have been concubines, but they were women, other women, who he had taken as wives, in addition to his royal wife, his real wife. Initially, that arrangement was made to allow the Pharaoh to enter into diplomatic marriages with the daughters of his allies. And that became a common custom, not just among the, the pharaohs of Egypt, but among kings in, in pretty much all of the 
uh, ancient countries back then. It is my supposition that Sarah Ree was going to be one of those lesser wives of Pharaoh. If that's true, then she had a period of purification that she had to, to go through that had to be observed uh, before she was presented to the Pharaoh. And I suspect that it was during this period of purification, I think that was about seven days, I may be mistaken about that, but uh, I believe I remember it was seven days long. It was a, a, a drawn out procedure that had to be done. I think it was during that seven days that God intervened to rescue Sarah Reed. He did that by inflicting a great plague upon the Pharaoh's house. The length of time that Sarah Reed stayed in, in the Pharaoh's palace is not told to us, but probably it was pretty short. It is recorded in the very next verse that the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah Reed, Adam's wife, Abram's wife. And in the very next verse, it is stated, and Pharaoh called Abram and said, What have you done unto me? And why didn't you tell me she was your wife? It appears that those plagues were extraordinary because immediately after those plagues, Pharaoh knows the reason for them and he calls Abram on the carpet. It seems certain that God was displeased with Abram's plan and he took the matter into his own hand. It also appears that the Pharaoh recognized that divine intervention and he restored Sarah Reed to Abram. And he commanded Abram to take Sarah Reed and all of his possessions, including those that had been gifted to him by the Pharaoh himself, and to leave Egypt. It should not escape our notice that the Pharaoh, once he understood what was going on, recognized the deceit that Abram had caused. And he strongly chastised Abram about it. Then, according to Genesis 12, 20, the Pharaoh commanded his men concerning Abram, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. That probably means that they were escorted all the way back to the border by soldiers and told that they would not be welcomed back into Egypt again. I suppose they may have camped again near Kadesh Barnea because we're only told in Genesis 3, 1, 13, 1 that they went into the south of Canaan. That seems to point to Kadesh. This would not have been a short trip If they followed the trade routes between Kadesh Barnea and Memphis down in Egypt, it would be close to 300 miles that they traveled. Using that same eight miles a day thing that we talked about last session about the, the oxen being able to carry loaded carts for that long. Uh, and if they rested ever uh, fifth day for uh, three or four days, it would have taken them 40 to 50 days each way to make that trip, both coming and going. It would, of course, depend on the length of the rest stops and whether or not they did, in fact, adhere to that eight-day uh, schedule and whether or not the soldiers were pushing them harder 
but since we're not told how long they actually spent down in Egypt, I think we can assume it was not long, but it might very well have been as long as four or five months. It's hard to say again. Both Abram and Lot, when they came out of Egypt, were wealthy men. While in Egypt, Abram added much sheep and oxen, he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels to his wealth from the gifts of Pharaoh. But he was already wealthy before that. It is stated in Genesis 13 too that Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. If in fact they did go back to Kadesh, then after they camped there for a few days and rested up, they traveled on up to Bethel where they had camped previously. When they initially entered into to Canaan, coming from the plains of Shinar and then from Haran, they stopped at Sechem. Abram built an altar there and worshiped God, made an offering to him. And then they traveled down between Bethel and Ai and established a camp. And it was while they were there that the famine occurred and they were forced to go into Egypt. Well, now it's been four or five months. Perhaps the famine is past. Uh, don't know for sure if that's true or not. But uh, they're back into Bethel or into the camp between Bethel and Ai. And once they, they get settled in there in that old place, now remember that's the second place that Abram uh, built an altar when they came in. The first was at Sechem and he offered on that altar of sacrifice and then when he got down and they camped at Bethel or just between Bethel and Ai he built a second altar it uh, doesn't mention that he tore them down so uh, I'm assuming they were still there because it is said when he gets back to Bethel and settles there Abram called on the name of the Lord throughout the time that that was spent down in Egypt during the coming and the going nothing is mentioned about Lot and what he did while Abram and Sarai were there with all of their uh, entourage we don't know what he did while he was there but he also was wealthy and he came out with Abram. We see while they were camped there near Bethel and Ai, and it may have been because of the famine that had been there, uh, Genesis chapter 13 and verse 6 says that the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. That, that means their substance was so great that the cattle that they had, the entourage that was with both of them, uh, was so much uh, that the land just would not support both of them. And in addition to that, uh, there had developed a strife between the herdsmen of Abram and the herdsmen of Lot and between uh, the those in the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites that dwelt there, they were also involved uh, in that some sort of a dispute and, and it caused strife that existed between them. And the result of that is that they decide to separate. And 
to keep their flocks apart and to get away from those Perizzites and Canaanites near Bethel there where they're dwelling. So Abram and Lot take a short trip southwest about four or five, maybe six miles to a mountain ridge that's just above Jericho. They went to that place because it's one of the high points in the mountain range there and they were able to look out over the entire valley want to get me on the other side and they saw everything that lay to the east and to the south of them they could even look north and perhaps they could see uh, a good distance north as well according to Genesis 13 and verse 9, Abraham had given Lot the choice of what he wanted to do. So when they're standing here on this mountaintop and they're looking out across all of the land that's laying open before them, Abram tells Lot, you pick. Wherever you pick, you, you can go there and I will go away some other place. We have no idea which way they were facing. Abram said, do you take the left hand or do you take the right hand? That means, do you take the land to my left or the land to my right? If they were looking due east, then the land on the left side would be that north of where they were standing. That might include the upper portion of, of Canaan. And that on the right-hand side would have been the southern portion of Canaan, uh, back toward Kadesh, which is the extreme most uh, southern city. Uh, but based on what Lot's choice was, most likely they were not looking east or west, but rather looking south. Because Lot says, I will take east, the land east of the Jordan River. He had looked out over it and he had seen that it was well watered, the entire valley. Now, it's shown in gray on this map and it's shown quite often in the gray. That gray is, is the extreme of the Jordan Valley. It doesn't mean that the land did not have grass and, and good uh, grazing land. It's just simply showing that that's the valley. It was lush, and it was green, and well watered, and uh, crops would grow easily. Uh, the flocks would not have any problem at all uh, getting enough food from the grass that was growing there. And Lot looked south, and he said it, the, it was well watered all the way down to Zoar. Now notice, uh, that's just under the Dead Sea. Uh, <clears throat> and so he took that portion, that that was east of the Jordan River. Abram agreed to Lot's choice. So Lot gathered up all that he had, all of his belongings, his animals, his servants, and he crossed the Jordan River. I don't know where. It would be interesting to know. It could be that he crossed there at Jericho. But then it might not have been. But he crossed the Jordan River somewhere. And that would be north of the Dead Sea because the Jordan River feeds the Dead Sea and nothing comes out of the Dead Sea. No water comes out of the Dead Sea. So Lot crosses the Jordan, and it says that he pitched his tent toward Sodom. You'll notice in the gray area, uh, just a little south of the Dead Sea, both the city of Sodom and the city of Gomorrah are, are penciled in there. 
And I have put question marks uh, by the names of those cities. And the reason that I've done that is because we can't be absolutely certain exactly where those two cities were located. Uh, those cities were completely destroyed by God. And they were never to be inhabited again. And historians say that it's hard to tell where they were. I think recently, maybe back in 2015 or, or thereabouts, there was a, an archaeologist that was digging around uh, there, and he thinks he has found some artifacts that probably uh, proves that, that it was the city of Sodom, but we don't know that, and we can't be for certain of that. Uh, and that's why I, I, I put the question marks there. I think the locations that I have here are pretty close to where they were. Most historians uh, agree with, with where I put them. In fact, I made this map uh, from looking at a different map, and uh, I put them as close as I could to where they were on that map. So uh, let's say they may not be exact, but they're, they're pretty close to where those cities probably were located. Abram, on the other hand, stays on the, east, on the western side of the Jordan River, and he moves us down to Hebron. That's where the red dot is on this screen. And he dwelt there. He made that be his, his home. Uh, that was far enough away and down on the mountain down from the mountain into the plains of Mamre. Uh, the grazing was good. There was not a large uh, number of people there that would interfere, that he would interfere with, and so uh, that's where he settles. And when he got there, what do you suppose was the first thing he did? He built another altar and he worshiped God there in Hebron. You may be familiar with the war that is described in Genesis chapter 14. It describes a war that took place in the valley of Siddim. That's around the Dead Sea area, probably pretty much of that gray area from Jericho south would be called the Valley of Siddim. And uh, Genesis 14.3 says, uh, it calls the Dead Sea the Salt Sea. You, you probably know that the Dead Sea is uh, one of the biggest producers of salt in the world. And uh, <clears throat> My guess is that salt was being traded along the trade routes uh, as far as, uh, as they go uh, for other th uh, things. Uh, it was used as money. It was a product that they produced there in that area, and they traded it uh, with those who needed salt. But in chapter 14 of Genesis, a war is described as having taken place there in the Valley of Siddim. The battle was mainly contained south of the Salt Sea in that gray area down around Sodom, Gomorrah, Zoar, and a few other towns that were down there. Uh, <clears throat> and according to uh, verses 4 and 5 of Genesis chapter 14, those cities had already been serving under the governorship of agents of Shedor Laomar. Uh, he was a king of Babylon, a king of Shinar. And probably he was charging them exorbitant fees and taxes. Uh, and they had been serving under this governorship for about 12 years. And finally, in the 13th year, 
they decided they had had enough and they rebelled against him. I guess they refused to pay him. I don't know how they rebelled, but they did. <clears throat> well, the result of that was in the, <clears throat> in the 14th year, uh, all of a sudden, Shadar Laomer and three other kings come all the way from Babylon uh, and Ur in that area, that whole area between the Tigris and the Euphrates that we saw earlier made that, that trip all the way over here in order to, to settle this rebellion. And the first thing that they did when they got here is they invaded those cities down south of the Dead Sea. And they took all of the food and all of the, the goods that the people in the cities had and took it with them and left. And that didn't sit well with the kings of those cities. There were five kings of the cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, uh, Zoar, uh, and another one I can't think of. And they banded together, those five kings, and men from those five cities uh, became be an army and they went to battle there in the valley with uh, Shadar Laomer, who was kind of the head king, although he had uh, other three other kings with him. Uh, five kings against four, but those five kings of the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Zoar, and, and others, they lost the battle. <clears throat> We've been talking about the fact that they came from the plains of Shinar and Babylon. And you may remember at the time that uh, the ark settled on Mount Ararat, uh, those who were on the ark, those eight people that were on the ark, came down from the mountain after a, a few a weeks and settled in the plains of Shinar. Well, that area is where these kings are from. Uh, this is a overall picture of the area, and you can see just how far it was that they had to travel. I doubt they went due west across that Arabian desert to get to, to uh, the Dead Sea. Uh, but they came from, from Ur and Babylon, and uh, not from Ur, but they, they came from cities very close to Ur. All of the cities that those king, those four kings mentioned as being kings of were between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, between Ur on the south and Babylon up to the north so they were all in that area and they had come from there as I said I don't think they went due west across that Arabian desert uh, I doubt that they would have made it rather they probably went the same way that Abram did when he left Ur of the Chaldees and traveled along the Euphrates River until he got to Haran up near the top there. And then he crossed over uh, toward the Mediterranean Sea and then came down uh, the coastland. Uh, and that's probably the same way they did it. That would make it almost a thousand miles or maybe a little more. It, if I recall right, it was 600 miles from Ur to Haran, and another uh, 500 from Haran, or 450 from Haran down to to uh, Bethel, where Abram was camped. So over a thousand miles, those armies marched in order to get there. Obviously, it took them a while, but they got there. And when they did. Uh, they pretty much looted 
those cities and they went to battle against the kings and the army that had been formed from the uh, I suppose the men of Sodom, Gomorrah and the other cities and they defeated them and so those, those people in those cities had nothing and, and unfortunately at the same time they took Lot captive. Now remember, Lot had pitched his tent towards Sodom. He was living down in that area, uh, probably somewhere close to Sodom, uh, during this war. I don't know how long that war lasted, probably not very long. And uh, uh, when they took all of the goods after winning the battle, and started back home, uh, they, they saw a lot there and they just grabbed him up along with what he had and, uh, and took him. There was one person, only one, that escaped when they were rounding up all of, all of the prisoners and taking them back toward Shinar. That one person that escaped knew where Abram was in Hebron. And he went there and he told Abram what had happened. And when Abram heard the news, he immediately assembled men and went after Shadar Laoma. Now, we don't know how big the army was. That army was big enough that it had defeated the armies of the five cities that lay south of the Dead Sea. Again, I have no idea how big the armies were. No doubt hundreds, if not thousands of men. But what is said, and I find this very, very interesting, is as soon as Abram gets the word that Lot has been taken by Shader Laoma, he gathers together 318 trained servants. These 318 men were all born in his household. And he had trained them. And he took those 318 men and he took off after Shadar Laoma. He caught them at Dan. Now you get up in the northern part of Canaan, I've got a red dot with the Lord Dan out beside it. That's the northernmost city of Canaan. And he took, he found them, he caught them there at Dan. According to verses 14 through 16, when he caught them there in Dan, he devised a plan. He divided his 318 men into different units. I don't know how big and how many units but he, he divided them into different units and he launched a night raid when they were camped outside of Hobah, which is just a little north of Damascus. And Damascus is circled in red there. So the army must have been large as if they were stretched out uh, and, he, and Abram had to have followed them from Dan to where they were camped while he was devising this plan. And when he got there that night while they were camped, not only was he able to free all of the captives that they had taken, but Abraham's 318 men, or at least part of them, chased down 
the king Shadar Leomer, and they slaughtered him at Hobah, just north of Damascus. They freed Lot. They took all of his possessions. They recovered all of the goods that had been taken from the cities down south, all that were left of them, and start back home. And upon Abram's return, the king of Sodom comes out to meet him in the valley of Shabbat. That's right near Jerusalem. That's the valley just a little south of Jericho. Uh, and that's where Abram met the king of Sodom. Also there was another man a man by the name of Melchizedek, who is said to be the king of Salem. Now, Salem was the original name of the city of Jerusalem. And some say that Melchizedek was the king of Jerusalem. Remember, all of the cities in that region had kings over them. They weren't kings like you think of as kings. They were like mayors, I guess. They ran the city. And and so a, a good many of the commentators believe that Melchizedek was the leader of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, it would have been called before that, before it was called Jerusalem, uh, it would have been called Salem. And that that's what that means when it says he was the king of Salem, he was the leader of that town. Others say that's wrong. Others say that, that uh, his background is unknown and we don't know anything about him. But we do know something about him because it's stated there uh, that he was a priest of the Most High God. And he had brought bread and wine, and he had blessed Abram. And Abram had made an offering to him. And they had given Melchizedek a tenth of everything that he had brought back and take, had taken from Shadar Leomer. Now while this was going on, the king of Sodom saw all of that. And he made an offer unto Abram. He told Abram, he said, you can keep all of the goods, all of the possessions. You can keep that. But we need you to return my people. And if you'll return the people, then you can have all of the goods as spoils. Abram refused any deal from the king of Sodom. Now remember, Sodom was known as uh, a, a place that was just given over to, to evil and idolatry. Abram didn't want to have anything to do with that. I'm sure he returned the people and he returned the goods too because it is said of him that he refused that deal with the king of Sodom. And other than the shares that his uh, allies, the men, the 318 men that he had taken with him, they, they by right were allowed spoils from the battle. And other than what they took, Abram took nothing. And all the rest they could have back. So Lot, along with the, the king of Sodom, head back home to Sodom, or near Sodom. And the others, they dispersed to their respective places as well. And Abram goes back to Hebron. This is a good place to stop. We've been at this for a while. 
we'll take up right here in the next session. I hope you have a good evening and a good day. Thank you for watching.